Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and get started because I've seen that somebody was on here. I guess they got kicked off or maybe they're coming back, but I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, since it looks like we do have uh, had one person come on. So we're going to look at some of the uh, some of the poetry. Hopefully you had a chance to read uh, all three of them. Um, if not, obviously you have until Sunday before you have to take the quiz. It will make this a little bit easier if you did read them, especially if you have questions about a particular uh, poet or a particular work. So we're looking at Chaucer's um, ballad first. Give you a little information about Chaucer. Chaucer was born sometime between 1340 and 1344. Early in his life, he was a soldier in the Hundred Years War. You probably uh, read or studied that maybe in a history class, I hope. 
and was taken prisoner during the English invasion of France. He had to be ransomed by King Edward III. And afterward, he served as sort of ambassador for the king, traveling through Europe on diplomatic missions. It was uh, through his travels that he became familiar with the inferential writers of his time, people such as Dante, which you might have uh, read in a world literature class at some point, who wrote uh, The Infernal and Patriarch, famous for creating the sonnet form that Shakespeare would later reinvent into the English sonnet, which I'm sure you probably read a lot of English sonnets at some point. At least I'm hoping you have had a chance to read some of these um, sonnets. Ch Ch Chaucer later served as Justice of the Peace and Member of Parliament. He seems to have been began writing in the mid to late 1300s, 1380s, and, and most famous for writing the Canterbury Tales, which is that, that's pretty much probably what you high school. I mean, if you remember anything from high school, you probably remember reading some of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Of course, he, you know, besides writing the poems, um, yeah, five minutes. Huh, five minutes. Yeah, I think so. I'll hold off on that. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that, guys. I had to empty that trash. Uh, but what I was getting at is, besides the Canterbury Tales, he wrote other uh, shorter narrative poems. He wrote some dream poetry. He wrote some sonnets, that type deal. Um, so when we look at this particular son or this particular ballad, it's not a song; it's a ballad. Uh, Two Rows of Monda. Uh, I read, I uploaded a video of me sort of doing my uh, version of Middle English. It's been a while since I had to read in Middle English. Uh, I took a couple uh, medieval literature classes at Georgia Southern and at Armstrong undergrad and graduate school. And it's pretty tough, especially since we don't really speak in Middle English anymore. Um, so if you want to sort of listen to see how it sounds, I mean, obviously you can you can uh, review my uh, recording of that. I uploaded it in the weekly folder, or you know you can probably find other recordings of Middle English on YouTube of, of, and that nature. Um, so as you can tell, the rhyme scheme, uh, because you want to pay really close attention to the rhyme scheme of poems, not only for this week but for the weeks to come. Uh, and to give you kind of a hint, the rhyme scheme is going to be sort of the question that pops up uh, on this week's quiz. If you look, it's A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C. And the rhyme scheme goes by the endings of the words at the end of each line. That's how we, you know, determine that. Uh, a, B, A starts again. B, B. C, B, C. And then the last uh, stanza here. So again, these are stanzas when it has, you know, groups of lines that are called stanzas. Um, as you notice, this is basically what? 21, 22, 23 is a 24 line poem. And it sort of has the same pattern. So the rhyme scheme for this particular two Rosamonda is A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C. And if we look at more of a modern version, uh, this may make more sense for you to, to sort of read, right? Um, but it continues, even in the from the Middle English to the modern version of it, it still has the same rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, A, B, A, B, B, C. BC, because if you look, um, the A and A, mind and twine, they rhyme. So that's why it's A. They, we always start with the letter A, all right, when you're dealing with the uh, rhyme scheme. If you look here, uh, Mapamonde, 
and round. Doesn't seem like it really rhymes so much, but we're looking at the U-N-D in these cases. Um, and then we have, again, the B, wound, round, wound, and mapimonde. So, <clears throat> and it, it sort of still follows that pattern because the A here, right, shrine and shine, rhyme with mine and twine. Divine, second, unsound. Again, we're looking at the O-E-N-D here. So just be careful. Uh, each one of these poems, for the most part, are going to have some sort of a rhyme scheme to it, unless you're sort of in um, free verse. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, free, free verse poetry doesn't really have a pattern or doesn't really follow a particular, like this one is a ballad. Um, Shakespeare wrote a lot of sonnets. It's a particular form. Um, <clears throat> you have Odes, Keats, Shelley, uh, Wordsworth, the Romantic poets are really good with the, uh, the Odes. Um, but not all poetry, as we know in music, some music is free verse too. Uh, but some music also has sort of a rhyme scheme or a, a pattern to it. So when you think of modern music, some, some of today's modern music uh, uses some of the same rhyme schemes and, and patterns that we, uh, we get out from Chaucer, from Dante, from Milton, from Wordsworth, from Dylan Thomas. Um, you know, all of these English and American poets. And of course, you know, world poets. I mean, there's in Indian poets, there's um, Middle Eastern poets, there's French poets. I, I will say that uh, a lot of a lot of the words and a lot of the language that we see in Chaucer actually sort of uh, came evolved from Fran uh, France. So there's a lot of French influence there. If you look here, map of Monday, uh, how Chaucer basically spelled it means map of the world. So when you actually look at the notes, because I provided notes uh, to the actual poem that's on your web page or on your Blackboard page, it will sort of go through the poem a little bit more. And it says really here, it says in the modern script, right, when we look at the modern piece, we can see more easily the romantic nature of the poem in which the speaker declares himself forever at the service of Rosamonda. Uh, despite the fact that she does not wish to involve herself with him. So really, he, uh, the speaker of this particular poem, uh, we, we can assume it's Chaucer, has this uh, effectuation with Rosamonda. Uh, and again, there's uh, many different um, um, rumors and different critics out there that have their own opinion of who this Rosamonda person could have been. Um, he sort of has a, um, a love interest in her, but she doesn't seem to really reciprocate um, that love interest in him. So if you look, the repetition of the last line of each stanza may be easier to see in the modern English as well. So if you can um, find a modern version of this, which you should be able to if you go to Google and just type in modern English of uh, Rosamonda, you, you should have a couple of sites that you can kind of choose from that will possibly help you get through the reading, but it's retained from the original. Repetition is another feature of the language of this poem, which helps conveys meaning. It serves here to reiterate the speaker's devotion to his love and possibly also his frustration with her determination to reject him. So um, she's rejecting him more so than actually trying to bring him in to her life. So that's a really good uh, piece. This here is more or less, this is coming from Sonnet uh, 116 from Shakespeare, just to show you the difference um, as it relates to some of the rhymes and the actual pattern, because it's a little different. The sonnet is different from the ballad form as it is here, uh, because a Shakespearean sonnet or an English sonnet is that, you know, sometimes Shakespearean sonnets are called English sonnets. 
they follow this pattern for the rhyme scheme. Sonnets are generally 14 lines in length. And then a Shakespearean sonnet will follow the A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G rhyme scheme. Um, generally, the last two lines of a Shakespearean sonnet uh, will be in G, G as the rhyme scheme. And they're also called couplets because there are two lines that their endings rhyme, uh, proved and loved. Uh, generally, when we talk about sonnets, especially a Shakespearean sonnet, uh, you'll have a turn or a volta about lines eight, which there's a turn in the sonnet. So we have line six, seven, eight. So the, the turn would start to happen here. We have some sort of a problem. Uh, the first seven lines or so, and then the turn happens to either uh, resolve that problem or provide a little bit more detail about that particular problem. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, looking at who so list to hunt, right? Sir Thomas Wyatt, his uh, particular poem is a sonnet. It's a, and we'll look here a little bit more what is a sonnet, right? In this particular case, we bring this up. The English word for sonnet comes from the Italian word sant santietto, meaning little song. Early versions of sonnet, which originate in Sicily in the 13th century, were often set to music and usually accompanied by a lute. Traditionally, sonnets were written on the theme of love, especially unattainable love. Uh, and then the poet Francisco Patriarch, a Roman Catholic priest, popularized the sonnet form that we now call a patriotic, a part, or, yeah, a, uh, particularly in sonnet, consists of an eight-line sonnet octave. So the first eight lines is going to be called an octave followed by a six line sonnet set set. The octave allow always follows a pattern A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, while the subset can change. Uh, the sonnet form was introduced in England by Sir Thomas Wyatt and Henry Howard, Earl of Sorcery. Translating Indian Italian sonnets, including those by Patriarch and Dante, and writing some of their own, they established an English form of the sonnet that Shakespeare were perfect. So we really get the, uh, Shakespeare is the one that sort of uh, put his own take to this uh, in a way to perfect the sonnet. The English or the Shakespearean sonnet consists of 14 lines. It is written in iambic pentameter. So what they mean by iambic pentameter is um, if we look here, it's there's a lost art when we read about poetry, which is called you know scansion of poetry, scanning the poem. So if I can give you some examples. Let's see if this will work. Potameter basically means five. So potameter simply means five meters. A line of poetry written I am at potameter has five feet equals five sets of stressed syllables and unstressed syllables. So sometimes you will see it here. Like if you look at sonnet 18 from Shakespeare, the little U means unstressed, the little diagonal line means stress. So shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So if you look, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress, unstressed, stress. And we have five of those. So that's where you get the, the whole deal iambic by pentameter. Um, if you look, most of you know our modern day speech patterns are sort of in iambic pentameter. And if you look at this particular website, they actually bring in pop music uh, from Shakespeare to Taylor Swift, and they look at Shake It Off as one of her songs. And she also uses what Shakespeare used 
and iambic pentameter because it shows it here. I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. So it has a unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress, unstressed stress. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum is basically how they sort of say it um, as it relates to this particular pattern. And there's five of them. Here is another poem that sort of has that same deal going on. Uh, Robert Browning's My Last Duchess has that deal. So going back, um, that's sort of what we have going on in this particular poem, even though it's not really an English uh, sonnet, uh, it's more or less a Petrarchian sonnet. So just sort of keep that in mind. And here we have sort of a version that was written during Wyatt's time, 1505 to 1542. And then we have sort of a modern version uh, it says, whoever loves to hunt, I know the hind, but as for me, alas, I may know more. Pursuit of her has left me so bon, bone sore. I am one of those who lags the furthest behind. Yet, friend, how can I draw my anguished mind away from the deer? Thus, as she flees before me, fainting I follow, I must leave off therefore. Since in a net I seek to hold the wind, whoever seeks her out, I put him out of doubt. <clears throat> that like me, he must spend his time in vain, for graven with diamonds set in letters plain, these words appear, her fair neck ringed about. Touch me not, for Caesar's I am. And wild to hold, though I seem tame. So if you look at this particular Latin phrase, it means touch me not. Uh, just sort of give you a little bit of a hint there. And it says this particular sonnet was written in the early 16th century and was first published in 1557 in London in an anthology of poems. Um, entitled Songs and Sonnets, written by the Right Honorable Lord Henry Howard, late Earl of Sorcery. Others published by um, Richard Tolley. The poem has an alternative title of which is The Lover Despair to Untain Unto His Lady's Grace Relinquish the, the Pursuit. And his sort of subject here that White is writing about in the sonnet is thought to be written for Anne Boleyn. So if you know a little bit of history, we kind of know possibly who Anne Boleyn is, and we can also do a little search here just to kind of have it. Was Queen of England from 1533 to 1536 as the second wife of King Henry the eighth. Uh, the circumstances of her marriage and of her execution by beheading for treason or other charges made her a key figure in the political and religious upheaval that marked the start of the English uh, Reformation. So again, this is stuff that you probably, you know, in world history classes, um, or if you're a history buff, especially an English history buff, you probably know a little bit about. Um, so switching gears from Chaucer and Wyatt, we sort of see we have a poem by actually Queen Elizabeth the first, who was born 1533 to 1603. Um, and we get this little poem when I was fair and young. So you see here again, the rhyme scheme is A-A-B-B, C-C-D-D. -D. 
E-F-G-G, H-H-I-I. -I. So it goes a little bit longer than some of the, the other poems. We notice we have one, two, three, four stanzas. And there's four lines to each one of these stanzas. So this is basically about a 16 line poem. So it's a little bit longer than what a, um, a sonnet would be. So it's not a sonnet. Um, if we look here, a little bit of the overview, it says, oh, bless Queen Elizabeth. She may have been the ruler of one of the mo most prominent countries in the world and may continue to be almost universally re revered by the British, but she seems to have suffered a pretty miserable and intolerable private life if we follow the three poems she composed in this section. We're only reading the first one here uh, for this particular week. The poem is about aging and the death of her desirability. When she was young, she enjoyed being a bit of a heartbreaker, turning down all sorts of suitors in quite a nasty way. Uh, now she's a bit older and now quite so pretty, and she misses the day when the boys were banging down her door. Um, not a, as it says here, not a naughty metaphor. She's the virgin queen, remember. Um, so we sort of get that. And again, if you look at some of the notes that I provided, it gives you some context on this particular poem. Um, the main idea here in this particular poem that we're reading for week six is regret, morality, and time. Uh, this is about feeling time has passed her by and taken opportunity from her. Uh, but it's also about dying or growing old and how it changes one's relationship with others in the world. So kind of keep that in mind um, when you're reading this. A little bit of the content. Again, this is sort of the notes. Um, it says, you know, at the beginning of the poem, we get the idea that Elizabeth, I'm gonna blow this up a little bit so you can kind of maybe see it on that screen too. Um, we get the idea that Elizabeth was a bit of a, well, <clears throat> quote unquote, you see the word, I'm not gonna go through it. Uh, far too snooty for her own good. She tells her that she used to have many self suitors, but she scorned them, meaning that she almost rejoiced in their suffering of pain or was mean in the face of the affection. This impression is intensified in the second stanza when she considers how many weeping eyes and sighting hearts she has caused. These images conjure sympathy from her suitors and the fact she doesn't even remember how many there are also increases the idea of her as being uncaring and emotionally careless. In the face of this, their misery, she grew prouder, which implies she actually enjoyed playing the role of heartbreaker and celebrated how aloof she acted towards them. Um, when we look at our third stanza, everything sort of changes. Venus' the sun is here. If you haven't worked it out, it's Cupid. And therefore, she is personifying love as the mythical Roman god, and he seems to have become annoyed with Elizabeth's attitude to love and hurting all those poor suitors. He plucks her plumes, which are feathers, and makes her not quite so desirable. So Cupid comes in in that third stanza and basically strips away her beauty. What is really happening is that she is aging and is no longer quite the desirable beauty of her youth. So, yeah, she's she's getting older uh, through that time. Right. Going back to one of the main ideas, time, morality, uh, regret. As she's getting older. This mythological uh, Roman God, mythical Roman God, Cupid, comes in basically takes away all her beauty, right? She ages. She doesn't really age gracefully. Um, we see those folks, especially like movie actors and singers, 
uh, who start out really young and, and, and good looking and stuff. And as they age because of their lifestyle, uh, they just don't age really well. Um, they don't look as good as they did when they were 25, when they become 45. And this is sort of what's going on in this poem as it relates to Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, once this happens, here, here again comes um, the other theme of regret. She regrets her former attitude. She liked the attention. And in the last stanza, we see this a little bit more. We see she is consumed with desire and is repenting her previous actions and wishing she not have been so dismissive of all her suitors. So now she has some regrets as she gets older as Cupid plucks her beauty away, as time moves on, um, she starts to regret some of the decisions she sort of did uh, as it relates to some of these suitors, how she turned them down when she was younger. Because as she's getting older, she's not getting as many knocks on the door for dates, so to speak. Um, which we can kind of relate to this in a lot of ways, because at some point we're going to age just, just like Queen Elizabeth did here. You know, at some point, how we looked, how we felt, and how we were when we were 18, 25, and 35 is going to be different when we're 45, and 65, and 85. Um, we're going to start putting on some pounds possibly as we get older. Um, we're not going to be able to have the energy or the ability necessarily to uh, work out as much to stay lean and healthy. Um, at some point as we get older, you know, our hair is going to start turning gray. Uh, it could possibly begin to fall out. Um, our skin may not look as um, clear and clean we may start getting a little you know a little wrinkled uh as we get older so <clears throat> when we were able to have multiple dates or sort of play the field so to speak before we we're able to settle down we may not have a, you know as many knocks on the door uh of people wanting to take us out for a date uh, because of age and how we are beginning to look now. We don't look, you know, when you're 55, you don't look like when you are 18 necessarily. Um, so all of these, I mean, really all three of these poems, um, they transcend our time because we can kind of relate to the speaker of the Chaucer Ballad. Uh, we have affection, we have love, we have infatuation, you can kind of say toward the opposite sex. Well, that opposite sex may not feel the same way about you. So you kind of have that rejection that we all will go through at some point if we haven't already went through it, you know. Um, the same thing with the Wyatt sonnet. Um, he's basically uh, trying to pursue Anne Boleyn which in that case she is a, the queen and she is a married woman and you know that just wasn't you know even today it's it, it's not really cool to pursue somebody that's already in a relationship with somebody else um a lot of problems can develop there and you know in the case of Anne Boleyn she got her head chopped off um serious consequences but then again, you know, King Henry VIII, he was kind of crazy as well. And then we get here, we get more, you know, instead of, because when we look at Chaucer and Wyatt's poems, we sort of get the male perspective, right? They're the ones pursuing and chasing uh, whoever their love interest is. Here we actually have the Virgin Queen Elizabeth I, and we get the sort of the, the, the female version of you know, when I was once young and pretty, I had all the men chasing me. But now as I'm getting older and, you know, 
my beauty is no longer there as it was. Um, you know, when I was younger, I was sort of mean. I was, you know, like it says here, um, <laughs> she was sort of a, you know, quote unquote, uh, a bitch about things. And now she's sort of regretting that because again, she's not getting as many people trying to pursue her, uh, the older she gets. The structure this is, um, it is a ballad in a form. It's a little different than a Chaucer's ballad, but it is a ballad. And it tells a story of Elizabeth's youth through to her middle age. Uh, the main things to comment on would be the use of repetition in the final line of each stanza and how it changes its meaning as we progress through her life. So we get from arrogant to vain to a warning to misery and repentance. So each one of these four stanzas is sort of like four stages of her life from her youth to her middle age. Um, we also note that the pace is slow and deliberately at a pace where we are forced to reflect about her past. Uh, so if you look, sort of the tone of this poem is remorse-filled and deeply sad poem in, in this particular critic's view. Uh, we can kind of have that similar view because it's showing her at a youthful age transitioning into um, her middle age, whether she's ready for that or not. She's transitioning into that period. And for each one of those four stanzas that we get from this particular ballad, uh, she's having to go back and reflect. Uh, the knowledge of the opportunity rich past being behind her is difficult for her to take. And it sounds like she is struggling to come to terms with the fact her life is destined to be lived alone until the end. So that's sort of what we are seeing in this particular poem and this particular ballad. So. We have two ballads. We have one ballad um, from Chaucer that shows a male perspective of pursuing love and sort of having that rejection. We have Wyatt's particular sonnet version where he's really just trying to pursue a married woman and a queen. And she is sort of telling him, hey, you know, it's going to be you're treading dangerous waters here by involving yourself with me. And if it ever gets out, um, we're both going to be in a lot of deep misery, which both of them eventually were. And then we end this week with Elizabeth's ballad, which is basically the opposite view, right? From a, it, it's a, female point of view of basically having beauty and youth and having a lot of suitors pursue her uh, for love, for a relationship, and she sort of turns them down uh, while she's young and youthful in, in a lot of different mean types of ways. But as she grows into maturity, as she gets into middle age, she realizes she could be um, approaching her own death in a way that she will die alone because she doesn't have anybody basically knocking on her door to pursue her because again, Cupid comes in and basically plucks her beauty. Uh, she has that regret of not taking up a suitor's offer when she could. And Again, she is that virgin queen, so she could possibly die as that virgin. Um, she doesn't have anybody there to build a relationship on um, because of how she matured and developed into middle age. All right. So sort of switching gears from here. I'm going to look at a couple other things from week six. 
again, you, if you want to hear sort of a my um, version of a Middle English reading of Chaucer's ballad, you can kind of uh, click on that video to look at if you want. Again, we have the poems. You click on and it'll take you to those particular readings. We have notes that will be helpful. Um, the quiz is due this Sunday. Um, be careful there. Don't let the quiz quiz questions try to trick you up. They're really meant to see how well you read all three poems. And if you took notes, right, you annotated your own text. And what I suggest, you know, how to do that is print out these poems and take your notes on these poems. Uh, write in the margins, right? Summarize maybe what you think the poem is mean, means to you. And then look at the notes that I've actually provided in hyperlink and take notes on the notes, right? Use them to sort of help you study uh, each one of these three poems because your notes and the notes that I provided will be really good study guide for the actual quiz. And the quiz is basically, it's, it's 10 questions. Um, I give you like three questions from the Chaucer poem, three questions from Wyatt, three questions from Queen Elizabeth's poem, and then there's one extra one that could come from one of these three. Uh, for the most part, the answers are really just short answer. And what I mean, one or two words will be suffice. You don't have to give me sentences or paragraphs or novel length answers because you're only going to have 30 minutes to answer these. Uh, clearly, um, there's no way that I'm not going to know that you're not using notes or anything. So if you do take notes, use the notes. Let them be for your advantage, right? Um, they will be helpful. Uh, you just want to be careful because it is timed. You don't have a lot of time to go back and forth uh, from each one of the notes that you take on each one of these poems. So that's why I say I print them out and probably take notes on the poem. And then while you're taking the quiz, you actually have your notes near you. Uh, obviously, if you really know these poems really well, you probably won't have to be shuffling through papers. Uh, you'll be able to go through and take the quiz, you know, a good bit of time. And you, then you can sort of go back and review your answers if possible. Um, there is one particular question that you may have to write uh, a sentence or two. But again, keep it brief, keep it to the point. Um, for the most part, if you read these poems, if you did go through the notes, if you took your notes, the quiz is not going to be something that's going to trick you up. If you didn't read the notes, if you didn't read the poems really well, if you didn't take your, you know, your own notes, annotated your own poems and that type of stuff, then yes, the, the, the quiz is going to be a little bit of a challenge for you. Um, each one of these poems, the sonnet and the two ballads are relatively short, so you can read them multiple times. I would probably suggest that you do that until you really get a, a, a very good handling of what each one of these poems, the meaning, the content, the tone, um, the actual poetic development and structure that's going on in each one of these. Uh, because if you just do one reading, look at the notes and say, oh, I got it. I'm going to go ahead and take the quiz. Those that sort of taken the quiz early, and I've had a few in this class that have already done that. Um, they could be setting themselves up for a little bit of a heartbreak when it comes to their actual grade, because it, it looks like they sort of just read the poem really quick. Um, Might have looked at some of the notes and just randomly went in there and started answering stuff and their grade is sort of suffering because of that. So be careful. I wouldn't necessarily take the quiz until you think you're truly ready to, you know, sit there for 30 minutes to take it. The other thing that I wanted to, to show you, because I know each, everybody's uh, sort of regrouping from the fiction essay and the fiction exam. I went ahead and put up some information about exam two, which is the, your, your poetry exam and your poetry paper. 
So if we look at the actual exam here, I'll give you some hints on that. This is going to be later in the month. It's going to be during week 10 uh, that we have to, that you're going to have to complete this exam. And it's basically going to be due on Halloween. Uh, so it's October 31st. It's a Sunday before 1159, the same deal like you had with um, the fiction exam. The deal is, though, the poetry exam will test your knowledge on certain poetic concepts and terms that you should have learned by keeping up with the re weekly readings and assignments during the last five weeks. So by the time we get to week 10, it's basically everything that we discussed, studied, reviewed, week six through 10. Uh, you will have 75 minutes, just like you had 75 minutes for the fiction exam to complete the 10 multiple choice poetry exam. So really you have like a objective multiple choice poetry exam here. The poem you will be tested on is below. So I give you the poem, right? Uh, there's a hyperlink. I'll show you that here in a minute. You want to read that poem as many times as you need to before taking the exam. So I'm basically giving you the exam question, or at least the poem to the exam, five weeks out. So you have this week, you have week seven, you have week eight, you have week nine, you have, you know, up to week 10 to really read the particular poem I'm giving you here. Take your notes, annotate it, write down everything that you can think of while you're sort of analyzing your poem, and you will have that as a study guide to help you get through it. Um, which that's why I say here, please annotate your poem by taking your own notes on the poem and about the poem. Now below, I give you some help, helpful hints that will help you answer those 10 multiple choice questions. And what I mean by multiple choice, you're gonna have like A, B, C, D choice, all right? One correct letter answer per question. Each correct answer is worth 10 points. So for a total of 100, right? If you answer all 10 of them correctly, you get 100 points. Uh, unlike the fiction exam, because there are letter answers here, there's not going to be any partial credit. So you either get the answer right or you get it wrong. And there's really no extra credit on this exam like I gave you, you know, fill in the blanks for the fiction exam. Um, the exam is password sensitive. I will provide that password about a week before the exam. So you have a chance if you want to take it a little earlier, you can. Just keep in mind, once you take it and submit it, that is your grade. So I wouldn't necessarily take the exam until you're 100% um, ready for it. The password will be different than the fiction exam password. And these are the hints I sort of give you. You know, why you read and study and annotate that poem, be mindful of what the poem title is and what the reader would expect to find or not find while reading the poem. Pay close attention to where the poem speaker lives or doesn't live. That's going to be sort of, again, these are hints um, that will help you get through and study for this particular poem. Um, know the meanings behind the words and diction in the poem, as well as the duties of what some of the people may or may not do in the poem. Be familiar with the various verse forms of poetry that we're going to cover, you know, throughout the next four weeks, right? We looked at sonnets this week, or one particular form of it, a sonnet. We looked at two ballads this week. Those are verse forms. You will find more verse forms in your e-text. We will also study more verse forms, week seven, week eight, week nine, so on and so forth. Uh, be familiar with the various poetic terms detail. So if you looked at your e-text in the poetry section, I give you uh, page numbers and that stuff in your syllabus. Uh, there's going to be, you know, vocabulary or key terms that go not only with, you know, fiction, go with poetry, go with the drama unit. You want to be mindful of those. Um, because some of your multiple choice questions are going to ask you about certain poetic terms, just like it's going to ask you about certain verse forms. Be mindful of the social range happening in the poem. And what I mean by the social range is the poem meant for 
uh, middle class? Is it meant for the upper class? Is it meant for the lower class? Like poor people, uh, sort of in the middle of the range, or the rich people? Also pay close attention to metaphors in the poem. Again, that's going to be uh, part of your poetic terms that you probably want to look at, metaphors and similes. Those would be very helpful to have a good understanding of various metaphors, not only in this particular poem that you're going to be studying for the exam, but metaphors in all the poetry that we're going to be reading over the next uh, four to five weeks. And I basically say, if you're familiar and mindful of the hints above and read the poem and take notes on it as many times as you need to, because I'm basically giving you the poem now, um, then your chances of really doing well on this exam coming up will increase um, drastically each week. I mean, as long as you're studying, you're taking notes, you're getting help, that type deal. So this is the actual poem. It's by Jonathan Swift. Um, you can copy the hyperlink there. You can kind of click on it. But I'm just going to copy mine. And it's going to take you to Poetry Foundation. It's a really short poem. But this is the one that's going to basically be what's covered in your poetry exam on the 31st of October. Um, you know, as we go through the next few weeks, if you want to start sending me notes that you're taking down to make sure that, hey, am I understanding this correctly? Um, what do you think of my notes so far, that type deal? Uh, I will look at that stuff and give you feedback, whether you're in the right direction, going the right direction, that type of stuff. You can also, you know, because everybody has the internet, uh, you can do sort of your own research on Swift's a description of the morning, right? Um, you can look up stuff in Google and you can kind of base your interpretation off what you're reading from other critics. Now, keep in mind, some critics could be right, some could be wrong. Uh, a lot of it boils down to interpretation. But if you, you know, are struggling with that, or are, there are certain areas in the poem that you don't really fully understand, then obviously email me. I'm here to help you. Um, I can't take the exam for you, but I can give you hints. I can give you suggestions. I can tell you if you're going in the right way or if you're going in the wrong way, that type of deal. So that's basically how the poetry exam is going to be uh, set up. So if we look, shifting gears here. If you look at the uh, paper two, or essay two, which is going to deal with poetry this time, let me pull that up a little bit. <clears throat> Now, this paper has to be a little bit longer than your fiction essay. Um, you're still using the same format, the MLA 9, double space, times in Roman 12. Here, you need to have 1,750 words or seven pages plus a work cited. Uh, this one is going to be due on Sunday, October 24th. So it's basically due a week before uh, the poetry exam. Again, same setup. By 1159, there will be a drop box. And really what you're doing here is you're sort of analyzing or you're doing a close read on two poems by D.H. Lawrence, uh, Piano One and Piano Two. So as it says here, uh, read these carefully. I give you the hyperlink. And we'll pull those up here momentarily. Uh, then write your essay in which you explain what characteristics of the second poem make it better than the first poem. Refer specifically to details of both poems by using textual evidence, quotations from both verses. Um, if you're unfamiliar, which some of you may or may not be, depending on if you should have had poetry in high school, you should have written about poetry at some point where you had a quote from poetry. There's a certain way that you have to quote 
poetry and MLA. I will be sending out a handout uh, either later this week or definitely next week if you check either your email or your Blackboard folder. That's going to detail how to quote poetry uh, in text and also as a works cited page um, because it's going to be different than quoting fiction like you did with your short stories and stuff from paper one. So if you look here, again, I give you the two poems. Again, I'm going to copy the link. You should be able to click on it and follow the instructions to open it up. And you're probably going to have to scroll down to about the fifth page. And there's the two poems that you're going to be basing your second paper on. You're going to read both of these and then you're sort of doing a you're doing a close read on both of them, but in a lot of ways, you're sort of doing a compare and contrast of both versions of piano. So as you can tell, they both are different just in the length. Um, again, you can start drafting and sending drafts of this second essay when you get a chance. Um, that's why I sort of wanted to go ahead and give you information both about the poetry exam at the end of the month and the poetry essay that's going to be due a week before um, your exam is due. Now, going back to the actual topic here, if you're just doing a strict close read, meaning you're just looking at both poems and using your own mind, using the stuff, you know, the poetic terms that you find that you learned week, week five, week six, week seven, so on and so forth, and the stuff from your e-text, then your works cited page should only have two entries on it, really. It should just have D.H. Lawrence's Piano 1 and Piano 2. Uh, granted, I realize this has to be seven pages or seven... 1750 as it relates to the word count. Um, if you need to go out and get secondary sources, then you probably want to use uh, the college library to get those sources, right? You're getting research. Uh, you're getting other critics' opinions, whether it's from another book or another journal article. It has to be something that's academic and scholarly in nature, meaning you, you just can't find everything off of Google. Uh, I'm fine with that as long as you document it correctly. If you need help, that's where sending drafts to me and smart thinking early on is going to be beneficial. If you wait until the week that this thing is due and you have to go out and get research and you don't give me a time to look at your paper, and you just plug stuff in, then I can kind of tell that the format and everything is probably going to be a little off. Um, you know, I seen that when I graded everybody's uh, first paper. Some of y'all did the in-text citation and the work cited correctly. Some of y'all didn't. Uh, and your grade kind of suffered because you didn't follow the format. You didn't follow the directions of the actual handout that was provided week two. Um, so please be mindful of the proper MLA essay format and how to go about quoting not only uh, poetry, again, I'm going to send you a hand about that, but a lot of the research, if you plan on getting research from Galileo or from the databases um, that our library provides, a lot of that stuff is going to be written in prose writing, which is just like, you know, quoting a short story or something. Um, a lot of ways, this is sort of a prelude to what's going to become paper three or your last really major writing assignment uh, before the final exam, which is going to be the research paper. And you're definitely going to need to get sources from Galileo databases in the library when we get into the month of November, because that paper is going to be a little bit longer um, than the previous two papers at that point. 
and you're going to need multiple sources, uh, scholarly and academic in nature. Uh, again, don't necessarily have to worry about that for this particular paper, unless you just want to add research, if that will help you with your compare and contrast here, your close reading of these two poems. What I would suggest, because it needs to be seven pages, right? You can write three pages on the first piano and you can write three pages on piano two, have an introduction and have a conclusion that and plus your work side of page that will give you probably close enough to either your word count of 1750 words or seven pages. So keep in mind when I say seven, seven pages, I really mean seven pages. I don't mean five. I don't mean nine. I mean seven. If I say 1750 words, I really mean that word count. I don't mean 1500 words. I don't mean 2000 words. Some folks were losing points because the first paper were, you know, was short. That one needed to be four pages. I had some folks that turned in two. Uh, that one needed to be a thousand words. I had some folks that turned in 750 words. Um, again, I give you parameters to follow. Uh, that's really what I want you to do. No more, no less. If you sent drafts to me in smart thinking multiple times, uh, three, four, or five, then generally your grade is probably better than most that didn't send me drafts at all. Uh, there were several folks in both of my English 1102 classes that just didn't send me drafts. It's like they wrote their first draft as their final draft, and it can you know easily be seen as I was reading and grading. I was like, man, this person must have wrote this paper like two days before it was due. Um, because it was just all over the place. And granted, you had every, you know, you had since week two to when it was due to get the help if you needed the help. Um, because those that did send me drafts usually got the higher grade. <clears throat> so I know we're running a little bit sh short on time here because I got another, um, session that I have to do for my other English 1102 class here in about 10 minutes. I see that there's uh, several people online now. Do we have any questions before we have to cut this one off? Yes, no. Any questions? Any concerns? Check the chat box. Nobody's typing anything in the chat box. <clears throat> so again, if you have any questions or concerns, please email me. I will probably get out another uh, virtual tutoring session for next week. Be on the lookout for that in your email as it gets closer to week seven. Uh, the week seven folder will open up later this week to give you a couple extra days if you want to go ahead and get a get ahead with the uh the reading for week seven and or the uh assignment that's going to be due the following sunday for week seven um i have graded everybody's exam i have graded everybody's first paper so if um if you check Blackboard, whatever you see right now, that's sort of your, your grade heading into um, week seven, besides the, uh, the quiz two for this week. Uh, if you did any extra credit that was built into the first exam, I went ahead and applied that to your grade. So what I did was, if I thought that your essay grade would benefit from the extra points, I put those extra points on your essay one. If I thought your exam grade would benefit from those extra points, I just put those extra points already on your exam grade. So whatever your exam, like let's say your exam has a 93. Well, if you did the extra credit, I already put that in there. Um, so you should see 
your grade for either your exam one or your um, essay one should have increased if you did some extra credit. One or the other, not both, but one or the other. So it was a win-win if you did some, some of that extra credit, which was basically, you know, I had some questions there that had blanks and you were, you know, supposed to fill in those blanks uh, correctly to get the extra credit. And you had up to 12 extra credit points. So in a lot of ways, if you got all 12 of, 12 of those uh, blanks right, which a good bit of y'all did, you basically increased either your essay one or your exam one grade by about a letter grade and a half. Because that's 12 points. Um, some folks just didn't do the extra credit. So whatever their grade was, was what they earned. All right. So if there's no additional questions, and yes, Megan, I see that uh, you were having some issues with your uh, Wi-Fi and stuff. Um, that happens, especially down here when we have storms and all that stuff. And sometimes the internet connections are just not the greatest. I know at my house lately, ever since COVID started, my internet's sort of up and down too. Um, please email me. Please reach out. Please attend these meetings when you can. Um, please send drafts. I mean, the earlier, the better. I can always, you know, I can do a lot more service the earlier you send me drafts, then, then I can if you wait two days before it's due because, you know, everybody at that point is freaking out. I have other tests, other papers, other quizzes from other classes coming in. Um, my attention is a little bit not, um, not necessarily focused on one particular area because I got so much stuff coming in at that point. That's why I went ahead and gave you the paper two topic for this week and information about the exam because you do have right the 24th of october if we look we're at the 28th of september 24th of october is here so you have the rest of this week one two three four so you basically have four and a half weeks to do paper two uh, as it relates to studying for exam two the poetry exam you basically have about five and a half weeks now to study for that so you have time. Everybody has the same amount of time. It just depends on when you really get started and get serious about studying or drafting um, for these two assignments. And use smart thinking. Smart thinking is free. It will help you. Uh, if you're having problems with smart thinking, please let me know so we can kind of address those because you may not be the only student that's having problems. So far, there's only been like one or two students I know that's had some issues with smart thinking. Uh, I hope that what we did rectified that. Uh, but if you're having issues with smart thinking, please let me know. The earlier I know, the earlier I can, you know, sort of get help with that to address it to see what the problem is. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. And I hope next week is great for you, too. Um, just remember, October 14th is midterm. We don't necessarily have like a midterm exam in this class, but what's going to happen again is that whatever Blackboard shows as your grade is the grade I'm going to have to send to the college because we have a second grade checkpoint. And I want to stress this again because there's several students in both of my English 1102 sessions. Um, that have really low F's. And what I mean by low F's, I have one student that basically has a seven as their grade right now. Um, I really, you know, in my personal and professional opinion, don't see how that particular student is going to pull the seven up to a 70 in 10 weeks. We don't have that many assignments. Uh, the assignments that we do have are weighted more than what they were earlier. And obviously, whatever they were doing the last five weeks hasn't been working for them because they have a seven. Um, 
some of these students that are failing the class are just logging in to see what you know what their grade is and then logging out we can check that we can see how long you're logging into blackboard where you're going um, which folder and which handout you're looking at how long you're doing it um, so just logging in and logging out and not turning anything in well of course your grade is not going to get any higher if anything it's just going to keep getting closer to a zero because you're not turning anything in um, I have several students that do have a zero um, because they haven't done anything for the last six weeks. I would strongly suggest, I mean, if you are at a point where you have a really low F, you know, a seven is a really low F, a zero is a really low F, um, you want to probably make the effort to visit the college registra registrator, um, uh, and possibly withdraw yourself or drop from the course. Uh, if you're doing enrollment, you're going to need to go through your high school coordinator. The thing is, you're going to have to let me know um, that you want to be dropped or withdrawn because otherwise, if you don't let me know, then the zeros are going to continue to you know pile up and your grade's not going to get any better. Um, that's why I said in that one email that you know, if you don't let me know, your high school coordinator will know if you're doing enrollment that you want to withdraw or drop the course, then when it comes December 15th, when we got to turn in the final grades, since you didn't let me know, then you're going to get an F in the course. You're just going to have to repeat it. Um, so please be mindful of weekly readings. Be mindful of weekly assignments when they're due. Um, check your emails often because I do send stuff through emails there as well. Um, remember that the weekly folders only stay up for a seven day period. So if you need to download or save or bookmark stuff, you need to do that before midnight each Sunday. Otherwise it closes and disappears. And, you know, if you're able to do all that and get help, send drafts. You know, I'm here to help. I want to help. I want you to uh, succeed in this course. Um, but it takes a little bit of effort on your part, too, because I can't take the, you know, I can't take these quizzes for you. I can't take, you know, write these papers for you. Um, I do in-person tutoring Mondays and Wednesday mornings from 1015 to 1115 at the Camden um, Campus Library. If you're in Camden or in the area, or if you want to come to an in-person tutoring session, bring your stuff. Let me know that you're coming. Uh, just be aware that you're probably going to have to wear the mask because we still have the, the whole COVID protocols going on. But, you know, that's that's another way that you can get free help if you need it. Uh, you can attend both. You can do an in-person and you can do this stuff on uh, virtual that we've been doing weekly, too. Um, so the help is there. If, if you need help, then please seek, seek it. Uh, it's free. Uh, and, you know, I'm willing to help you as much as I, you know, humanly can. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end this particular session since I have another one going. I hope everybody has a great week. And I look to, you know, Seeing you again next week during the uh, the next virtual tutoring session, or if you want to come in person, I have one, like I said, tomorrow morning as well. Just let me know. Have a great week.